and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, we're going to look at this beast, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. People try and memorize this. Oh my goodness, don't do it. We're going to do it Penguin Prof style so you understand it and don't have to memorize it. If you find these videos helpful, could you please help me out by just taking a second and clicking those buttons below? It makes a big difference. Thanks. You want to stay tuned to answer these questions. What is the RAS? What does it do? Who's involved? Who are the players? And how do those f***ing inhibitors work? You'll find these on a lot of exams, and I have to admit, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, the good news is that actually if you understand the pathways, the names of all of these uh, groups of drugs actually make sense. So that is what we're going to do today. What you should know already, some basic anatomy and physiology of the kidney and the nephron in particular, as well as homeostasis, negative feedback loops, and the world of signal transduction. And of course, I will put links to these videos down there. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, we have the terms ligand and receptor. The ligand is the thing that binds, and we use this symbol here for an inhibitor of that ligand receptor binding, so some sort of antagonist, for example. This can be found at the surface of a cell. It can also be found inside the cell, in the cytoplasm, or even in the nucleus. Today we're going to take a look at aldosterone, which is a steroid hormone, and its receptors are in the cytoplasm. And you can block this reaction between aldosterone and the aldosterone receptor with an aldosterone receptor antagonist, like this drug spironolactone. So we show that with the symbol here. So I want to make sure that is clear. All right, let's get started. What is the RAS? It is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. You can see why an acronym is needed. It's an endocrine pathway. It regulates fluid balance. We're talking about all kinds of extracellular fluids all over the body, the blood plasma, the lymph, interstitial fluid, and also arterial vasoconstriction. So it is a major player in regulating blood pressure. When the RAS system is activated, you get increased fluid retention as well as vasoconstriction and both of those things will increase blood pressure and this is problematic for patients who are dealing with hypertension heart disease renal disease complications due to diabetes etc many different drugs affect various aspects of this system and we're going to go through those and understand how you can sort of take out different steps along the pathway and collectively these drugs are going to lower blood pressure and reduce stress on the heart. The players in this system include, there's a lot, the kidney, the liver, the lung, believe it or not, and the adrenal cortex. And we've got some more too. We've got the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, and the heart and the cardiovascular system as a whole. So as you can see, there's a lot of players here. Extrinsic activation of this system is going to come from a detection of low blood volume or dropping blood pressure. And this could be due to uh, severe dehydration, hemorrhage, those sorts of things. We have intrinsic regulation too. That is to say the nephrons themselves activate this system. And we're going to look specifically at the renal corpuscle. So that is the glomerulus, the afferent and efferent arterioles leading in and out of it, and the glomerular or the Bowman's capsule. So quick review of those parts right here. The region we're really interested in is right here, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So you want to notice the afferent arteriole, this is the efferent arteriole, and this is the distal convoluted tubule cut in cross-section. And you want to notice these little green jobbers here. These are granular juxtaglomerular cells, or just granular cells, and they're going to produce the enzyme renin. And it's important to notice how close together all of these structures are. In particular, the distal convoluted tubule is very, very close to the afferent arteriole. And there's some specialized cells right here called the macula densa that are going to be really important. They sense what is going on in the filtrate in the lumen of the distal tubule. And they can send a message to those granular cells to help activate the RAS system. The intrinsic RAS activation can come from beta-1 adrenergic stimulation, so that's from the autonomic nervous system, 
a decrease in renal perfusion. We call this hypoperfusion. And the granular cells themselves sense that. So they can sense the volume change of the blood going in and out and a decrease in sodium chloride in the distal tubule. That is sensed by the macula densa. So what's happening is the macula densa, these cells right here, are able to sense the sodium chloride concentration of the filtrate. And a drop in sodium chloride concentration is usually due to low filtrate volume. So if there's not enough filtrate going through at any given time, then you have more time for reabsorption of sodium chloride. That's what's going to cause that drop. So any of these three things will cause the RAS activation to occur. And what's going to happen is those granular cells will secrete the enzyme renin, which is also known as angiotensinogenase. I'm just going to call it renin if that's okay for you. Uh, it is an enzyme. It is not a hormone. A lot of students mess up with that. There are no peripheral receptors for renin, and it is an enzyme. It catalyzes a reaction. We're going to see that reaction right now. So the liver is where we start, and it produces a protein called angiotensinogen. It's 453 amino acids long, but the first 12 amino acids are the ones that we are interested in. Oh, look! There they are. Now, angiotensinogen is produced all the time and released constantly by the liver and floats around in the body, but it is completely inactive. However, if it runs into the enzyme renin produced by those granular cells, there is a hydrolysis between these two amino acids shown here, and what you get is a decapeptide called angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is also not biologically active, so now it's flowing around all over the place, and it has to be activated by an enzyme that is found primarily in the surface of pulmonary epithelia and also in renal tissue and other places, as we're finding out now. This enzyme is called an angiotensin converting enzyme. Doesn't that make sense? We call it ACE for short. So when angiotensin 1, as it flows around the body, passes through the pulmonary capillaries and it meets up with the ACE enzyme, then you get the final cleavage here that converts angiotensin 1 to the active hormone angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 will then be available to bind to AT receptors, as they're called, which are found throughout the body. These are primarily G-protein coupled receptors, and they're going to cause a lot of different effects. There's actually four different types. The important thing is what angiotensin 2 does. Angiotensin 2 causes systemic vasoconstriction of arterioles. That in and of itself increases blood pressure. We're going to get stimulation of the sympathetic division. So you're going to get things like an increase in both heart rate and stroke volume. That, of course, will also increase blood pressure. You're going to get vasoconstriction of the efferent and, to a lesser extent, afferent arterioles in the nephron. That's going to keep the pressure in the glomerulus high. We're going to get decreased blood flow to the nephron peritubular capillaries. Some of you may know those as the vasa recta. And so if you decrease the blood flow there, then you're going to get reduced washout, as it's called, of the ions, primarily sodium, chlorine, and urea, and increased sodium reabsorption in nephrons overall. And that's going to be due to a stimulation of sodium proton exchangers. In addition, the adrenal cortex is going to be stimulated by angiotensin II to release the steroid aldosterone. And aldosterone is going to have an effect in the nephrons as well. You're going to get an increase of ion and water reabsorption. So again, all of these ions and water reabsorption is going to act to increase fluid, of course, and ion retention and increase the blood pressure. And finally, we're going to have the release of vasopressin, or ADH. This is a hormone that is made in the hypothalamus. It's stored and released by the posterior pituitary gland. And what vasopressin does is it acts on the cells of the collecting duct, and it causes water to be reabsorbed and it also stimulates thirst. If you want to see more about that in particular, and actually how that happens in these really cool little guys called aquaporins, you want to click on this little link and check it out below. The easiest way to get around this is to go through the whole process from start to finish, and we'll put it all together. So we're going to start with the liver, 
and the release of that protein angiotensinogen. And again, that is not biologically active. It will combine with the enzyme renin made by those granular cells, and angiotensinogen will be converted to angiotensin 1. Again, not biologically active. But it will flow around the body, and it will come into contact with that angiotensin-converting enzyme found primarily in pulmonary capillaries, but also elsewhere. And that enzyme will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. That is the active hormone, which is going to cause a whole variety of effects. Increase of activity in the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, an increase in the reabsorption of all kinds of water and ions in the nephron. You're going to get a stimulation of aldosterone secretion by the adrenal glands, arterial vasoconstriction throughout the body, and you are going to get the release of vasopressin, or ADH, from the posterior pituitary, and that will act to cause water retention or water reabsorption in the collecting duct. Oh my goodness, I know. All of these things together, all of these effects of angiotensin II, if you look at them, they all act to retain water and ions, and that will cause blood pressure to increase. And all of these things will feed back negatively on the cells that are producing renin in the kidney. So that's the negative feedback loop. And this is the entire loop. If you can kind of get your head around, um, you're going to be able to answer most questions about the RAS system uh, from an overview like this and clinical applications will make a lot more sense. So we have four major groups of drugs that we can use to inhibit this system. Aldosterone receptor antagonists, direct renin inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs or SARTAN. So we're gonna go through all of these and you're gonna see that the secret's in the name. So if you understand the pathway, then these names will make sense and then how the drugs work will also make sense. Let's look first at the aldosterone receptor antagonists. So right away, you should be able to tell what these things are going to do. Um, you may see them as anti-mineralocorticoids. Aldosterone is called a mineralocorticoid, and so sometimes you'll see the uh, receptors referred to as mineralocorticoid receptors. Um, that's, that's really the trickiest part of this thing, if you ask me. These are intracellular receptors, right? Aldosterone is a steroid. They are called potassium-sparing diuretics, and hopefully you can see why. So, for example, spironolactone, that's the most common one. So I have the trade names here in parentheses. This is an antagonist. It blocks aldosterone from binding to those receptors, so it will prevent aldosterone from causing these effects. Now, direct renin inhibitors, this kind of makes the most sense. It's the most obvious way to limit the RAS system. It's like, we'll just kill it at step one. Interestingly enough, researchers have been working since the 70s to develop a direct renin inhibitor that has oral bioavailability. It turned out to be really difficult. There's really one on the market as of the making of this tutorial. It was approved in 2007. It is still the only one available, and it blocks the production of renin. ACE inhibitors. These are much more common, and there are many more of them. So if you block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, then you don't allow the production of the active hormone. Here are some common ACE inhibitors, and you can see if you block that enzyme, you're not going to get the conversion. And finally, there are angiotensin 2 receptor antagonists. They are sometimes called angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs, or sartans, and they prevent angiotensin II from binding to their receptors, thus preventing their effects. So finally, this slide is a summary of all the options for inhibition. We can inhibit the effects of aldosterone by using aldosterone receptor antagonists. We can inhibit the production of renin. We can inhibit the production of the angiotensin converting enzyme. Or we can inhibit the actions of angiotensin II on their receptors throughout the body. So what I hope you can see here is that by understanding the different parts of a pathway, it's very easy then to understand how various drugs will work. And hopefully it becomes something very different than just a memorization exercise. 
As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons, like, share, and subscribe. Join me on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.